So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and, and uh, get kicked off. Um, so as the title says, uh, my talk is about why moving fast requires focus tools. Uh, if you've somehow found yourself in the wrong room, uh, this is Seattle One. Uh, and my name is Ethan Rogers. Um, so thanks for, uh, thanks for coming to hang out today. Uh, I just want to take a quick second to, to say thanks to everyone who's here um, who e had either joined us last year for the Spinnaker Summit or this is your first time. Um, the, the involvement of the community like really helps out the project. Um, and you know, Andy Glover says this a lot, but the more innovations we get from more people who are involved, uh, the better the project gets. So uh, I just wanted to you know, thank everybody for uh, coming out. So uh, just real quick, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ethan Rogers. I'm a senior software engineer at Armory. Um, I'm also a Spinnaker core contributor, so I've been working uh, on the project in various aspects for the last couple years. Uh, most of my focus has been around Kubernetes. I did a lot of work on the V1 provider. Um, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the V2 provider and, and helping people start to adopt it. Um, so if you have any questions about, about Spinnaker or the Kubernetes provider, just come, come hang out with me and, uh, and we'll talk. Um, you can find me on uh, Twitter at E underscore F Rogers, not Froggers, um, and Ethan F Rogers on Slack and GitHub. So, um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit. Um, so what we're going to talk about today uh, is just is a couple things. So the first thing I want to talk about is moving fast. Um, this is a concept that I've really learned a lot about lately. Um, I've, I've actually worked for companies where moving fast was not a very important thing. Um, and so what I found in talking to a lot of engineers at, at smaller companies, companies that aren't, aren't moving as quickly as uh, some other companies, is that it's not really talked about. Um, so I, that's why I wanted to cover that. Um, and then we're going to talk about application-focused tooling. So this moving fast plays in, into it. Um, the tools that you use need to be efficient, and they need to actually help support you in moving fast. Um, and so that's one thing that we're going to talk about. And then we're going to look at some different applications out there that we all use every day um, and, and look at how these applications are actually using some of the principles that we'll talk about in the previous two points. Um, to, to make that a little bit better and to make your experience more efficient. Um, so like I said, uh, I just wanted to kind of give this talk to um, kind of promote the idea of moving fast uh, and how and explore a little bit about how we can build that uh, into the tools that we're building. Um, so just so I know uh, what, you know, what our audience is today, uh, how many of you would consider yourselves like ops folks, like infrastructure, monitoring, um, maybe even back ends. Okay? Uh, what about like application engineers, people that are actually working on product uh, that's being used by non-developers? Okay? Um, and what about DevOps? You kind of play both sides of the role. Um, all right. So the, I think the thing about this talk is that each one of these um, three areas can take a lot from it. So um, infrastructure folks can think about the tooling that they're building for infrastructure and how that affects application engineers. Application engineers can look at tooling that's coming out of these organizations and, and say, this is either making me more efficient or it's not helping me at all. Um, and so that you can kind of get a sense for what you need uh, to do your job well. Um, and then DevOps folks really play both sides of the line. So um, you know, the, the tools that you use every day, you probably have, a, have an impact on. Um, so you can, you can really look at what you're building um, and, and start to build that into your applications. Um, so, you know, as, a, as an industry uh, adopting DevOps, we really see kind of a sliding scale. Um, and the reason that I, I wanted to see how many people considered themselves ops folks versus, uh, versus application developers was because I think even though we're doing small focused teams with DevOps, uh, we have people that kind of sit on both sides of the line. And so, um, the people who are doing infrastructure know the infrastructure tools and they're familiar with that. But people who are actually working on applications may not be familiar with those tools. Um, so I think we need to find a common ground um, with the tooling that we're building. Um, so um, moving, uh, moving right along. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is moving fast. I want to define that. I want to dig into what that looks like um, from kind of a development team organization perspective. So this first slide here uh, is something that you probably are all familiar with. This is the uh, software development lifecycle. Um, and 
it kind of defines a few stages that we go through when we're actually working on software. Um, you may kind of merge some of these stages together. So one through three might be one you know, entire part of the process for you. Uh, four through five may be another part. Um, but this really kind of defines what we're doing every single day as we start looking at, at applications. So the first little chunk uh, would be planning um, and analysis, and that's kind of one through three. This is where we take requirements from users. We start defining what our application looks like, what our project looks like. Um, and we start really like honing in on where we're going. Um, the second part is implementation, which is really captured in parts four and five. So you're doing implementation, testing integration, um, and stuff like that. And so that part is where we've taken the requirements and we've started building. Uh, and then the last part is, is maintenance. Um, it says maintenance on there, but that's really um, getting, getting feedback from users, getting real data coming in. Uh, to influence the product that we're actually working on. So one of the goals of moving fast is we want to make this cycle as small as possible. Um, so we want to be able to get through from point one to point six as quickly as we can. Because the real data that we care about, the data that actually helps our customers and our users, is at point six. And everywhere on this, on this slide where we're not getting data is we're, we're not moving fast. We're not innovating and we're not capturing um, the value that our customers actually have. So when I say moving fast, what I mean is as an engineering team in everything that we do, we want to have the tooling in place to help us get there. Um, so like I was saying, moving fast is getting through the SDLC as quickly as possible. Um, and, and I think um, you know, smaller teams and larger teams can kind of move fast. Moving fast is really uh, dependent on your organization and your size. So small DevOps teams, small focus teams, maybe at a startup, can move through that process really quick because there's, you know, they're building a product, they're iterating quickly, and learning about their customer very fast. Compare that to an organization like in the, who here has read the Phoenix Project? All right, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's about a, an imaginary company that, um, that is having a lot of internal IT difficulties. Uh, it was really kind of, um, it's a fictional story about kind of the birth of DevOps in an organization. Um, but we can look at large organizations like this and we see teams that want to move fast, but there's a lot of process and a lot of fat uh, that needs to be trimmed away in order to make that happen. So, but that's not to say that only startups can move fast and that large organizations can't. Anybody can move, move quickly. Uh, the goal is, to make your tooling and your processes as efficient as possible to get through that and get all the way back to customer feedback. Um, and then how you do that uh, is largely dependent on kind of the requirements or some of the restrictions within your org. Uh, but just so you know, it is still possible. Um, and really, this is kind of the, the, the birth of DevOps and kind of the way Agile uh, has taken hold uh, over the last, I don't know, 10 years. Um, this is really the goal. We have processes like Agile. We have uh, cultures like DevOps to make this a, a reality. Um, so a lot of you are probably practicing these things today. Um, so let's take a look at this, this definition of DevOps. Um, I think this really embodies kind of the spirit of what we're here talking about today. DevOps um, is a combination of cultural philosophies, practices, and tools that increase an organization's ability to deliver applications and services at high velocity. Uh, velocity is key. Um, what we want to be able to do is produce product um, and do our work as efficiently and as fast as possible, and that's one thing that DevOps promotes. Um, so I think one of the most important things that we can talk about when we talk about moving fast and we talk about um, trying to build cases for building out efficient tooling and, and dev tooling um, is why the business cares. Really, we're all here. Um, under the banner of our business, we're all working on producing product for some company uh, that may be, like I said, that may be tools that just normal customers are using or your customers may be developers. But at some level, you have to build a business, business case. So in order to kind of build a business case of why we want to actually move fast, there are a few points. So the first one is decreased time to value. So time to value uh, is really the measure of how quickly your customer finds value in your tooling. Um, for an engineer, if we're talking about dev tooling, 
the value is really uh, how fast and how efficient I can do my job. If I can find the information I need when I need it, then that's value. And what we want to do is we don't want to get bogged down in, in the inefficiencies of the tool because that's not a fast time to value. So we want to have low time to value uh, so our customers can get as much out of our tool as we can. The other point is competitive advantage, and that kind of plays into, um, into time to value. Um, because if we're, if we're iterating and our product teams and our, our tooling teams are iterating quickly, um, what, we can, what we can get is we can actually get a product out to the customer faster. If we can get a product out to the customer more quickly, then that customer is more likely to have what they need. So I'm sure a lot of you have had times where your customers have come to you and said, I need feature XYZ. Uh, and you've said, all right, that's going to be three months of development, probably a month while I wait on a release train to get this out. So you're looking at four months. In that four months, your competitors could be producing that feature more. If they're moving more quickly, then that feature is going to land more quickly. And so what happens is your business actually loses revenue. They lose the opportunity to help that customer. And so by moving quickly, uh, by having tools that help us move quickly, then we can have more competitive advantage. Um, the other one, and this is actually something that I learned when, uh, when I joined Armory, um, but if we move quick and we can iterate fast and we can get things into our customers' hands, we actually reduce the risk of uh, the investment in the time that we're putting into developing a product. Um, Believe it or not, the time that you spend working on something is an investment for someone. It's an investment for you. It's an investment for your company. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to decrease what we call um, inventory. We want to get as much code out of the development process and into the hands of the users where it's valuable. Um, and so by doing that, we can reduce the risk uh, that something will not pay off. Uh, but why do you care? Um, you know, You probably are listening to me talk about how the business is really the one benefiting from you moving fast. Um, but I, I, all of us in here are engineers, and all of us in here love writing code, and actually the feeling we get when somebody have, finds value in what we've done. Um, so the, what I was saying earlier, the smaller feedback loops are actually beneficial to you as well. Um, because you can get that input from your customer. You can start developing quickly um, the, the features that you want to work on. Uh, if a customer is telling you that a, that a feature um, that you've worked on is not valuable, what we want to do, oh, sorry, what we want to do is we want to be able to help that customer. Uh, and a smaller feedback loop really gets us there. Um, continued experimentation um, is another is another point of why we want to move quick. Um, if we can if we can take that feedback and we can actually um, experiment with that and say. Uh, is this valuable to you? Are you finding um, a reason to use this feature or this product? Uh, we can, can just continue like performing experiments. And experiments don't really work unless you can quickly react to them. So if you uh, make a change to feature XYZ um, and then your customers start complaining about it, maybe it's a small fix. If that small fix is what it takes to actually win, uh, win the feature and win the customer, being able to get that in their hands quickly is actually super valuable. Um, so that's what we want to do. Um, and kind of along the similar line of, uh, of DevOps, we want to have focused efforts. So if we have small teams that are moving quickly, they can iterate on smaller individual chunks and features um, without actually getting into the cycle of, I've done X, Y, Z, let's wait for it to release, and then move on to something else. In this point, it's actually about context. So um, is, does anyone here have, um, have a release train, or they have to wait to push something out to production? Maybe it takes a couple months. Maybe it takes a couple weeks, a couple days. Um, what, what I've found, actually, in my experience in, in working at companies that kind of have that is when I've actually finished a problem, I have to wait for that thing to ship. So if there are any problems with that a month down the road, I've already started working on something else. So I don't have the context that I need to debug the issue because I, because I wasn't moving fast. I wasn't um, moving quickly. Um, so having focused efforts um, is really something that we can get when we move quickly. Um, so what can we do about it? You know, I, I've talked about moving fast. Um, I've talked about the reasons why we want to move fast. But what can we do? Uh, 
this, this whole talk is about um, building tooling that helps us achieve that. Uh, as, as developers, one of the most important things that we can, we can have is tools that help us do our job. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about application-focused tooling. Um, so this is kind of this is another view of the uh, the software development lifecycle. It's actually what I would consider um, the implementation and kind of the testing phase. So over here on the left, you have what I call like development exercises, and this is stuff that happens um, when you start coding on something. You start pulling stories out of Jira and you start actually making commits. You know, you have things like um, you have tickets and you have a code repo and you have artifact storage and all of these different things. And then in, on the right, you have kind of what would be more traditionally considered ops-focused activities, things like monitoring, things like logging. Um, and then in the middle, we have, we have delivery. And hopefully, we're all here using Spinnaker or interested in Spinnaker. So this is really kind of where um, I think naturally the line falls, because we have a lot of things that engineers are working on on the left. We have things that operations and infrastructure folks are working on the right. And what we've actually found um, at Armory and what I've actually found at, at, another, at other companies is that we lose so much uh, important information at that middle line. We actually lose all the information about the JIRA tickets, all the commits that are actually going out. Um, and it's actually really hard to even make that come into the middle. It's even more difficult what I, from what I've seen to bring it into the right. Um, and so when I say application-focused tooling, what I mean is that we want, we want tools that capture this entire process. Um, and we do that in a couple ways. Um, so before we talk about that, though, let's talk about some of the traditional tools. Can I get, how many people are using Jenkins? A lot, yeah. How many people who are not using Spinnaker are using the AWS console to figure out what's actually running? Good. No one. Um, but, but these tools are really kind of, they, what I like to call, they're built for the monolith. Um, Jenkins is kind of really built, uh, the organi like the way you organi organize projects and jobs, uh, is, is built for single applications. Maybe those single applications are only deployed in one region. Uh, AWS, the console, could probably be considered that, for example, because you can't get a holistic view um, of what's going on. So, um, you know, you may have applications that won't run on one server, um, but most of these tools are actually focused on a single slice of that, that graph that I showed you earlier. They are focused on artifact storage, or they're focused on code repositories, or they're focused on logging, and they're focused on monitoring. Um, and what I think has happened is that we've kind of, as we've gone into this more DevOps-focused um, kind of culture, and we have this ecosystem that's evolving around microservices. We've lost a lot of what we need when we try to fit um, modern things into traditional tools. So focus tooling uh, has a couple attributes that um, will help us get to get this kind of uh, flywheel moving and we can start moving fast. The first thing is it shifts context. Um, so when we talk about shifting context, the most important thing to remember is that um, we want to focus on the single bit of, of uh, product that we're working on. Now that may be your application, that may be, um, it may be something else that you're working on, but when we think about focus tooling, we need to think about the problem, we need to think about the information that we need in the context of what we're trying to solve. Um, and so, um, the, you know, when we think about it, I don't know, imagine a situation for like an outage. Uh, if your specific service or your application is having, a, having some downtime, it's when you look at the application, you want to be able to trace all of the different bits of that application that are happening through the SDLC. So you want to be able to determine what the commit was that possibly caused the outage. You need to see logs for that application um, kind of bucketed in that way. Um, and so that's, we want to shift our context away from kind of more traditional tools, more infrastructure related things, and start thinking about the application. Like I said, as developers, the application is what we care about. Um, second, we need something that reduces cognitive overhead. And this is, a, this is actually a problem that I'm really passionate about um, because I've worked, I've worked with, uh, with infrastructure engineers who are providing tooling um, to developers that are actually being asked to take on a lot more responsibility these days. 
Um, and making the mental leap, having to understand the application that you're working on, and then having to jump into some infrastructure stuff that may not make sense to you is very difficult, and the barrier to entry is really high. Um, so what we want to do is we want to bring these tools down that A, provide enough functionality and provide enough context for what we need, um, but also make it easy for them to do these more um, complex tasks that they may not be familiar with. So the second point is we reduce the cognitive overhead and make it more easy to, uh, to adopt. Finally, it's holistic. Um, and this, you know, the, the, the application that you're using to do these tools doesn't need to do everything. Um, but what we want to do is we want to capture every piece of that SDLC, every piece of that development process in a tool or suite of tools where everything carries over. So we want to be able to get a, a high level picture of what we want. Um, and so focus tools really focus on every piece of the SDLC. Um, so let's, uh, what I want to do now is kind of take a look at some tools that, that apply these principles, what I consider um, kind of good tools or good examples of tools that do this. So the first one is GitHub. Um, this is really where it starts. The, the development effort starts at the Git, at the Git repository these days. Um, and so when we, you know, this is, a, this is kind of the principle of um, shifting context. We can shift our focus to our application, and it starts here. The, this Git is the source of truth. Um, and when we think about our application, and we think about moving quickly and, and iterating on our application, we start at GitHub. Now, um, one thing that I think is really, it, 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 it's a contrived example, and it's very simple. But if we think about it, uh, it really demonstrates what we're trying to get at. The pull request in GitHub is actually a really great example of this. It's focused. It's focused on the application. It's actually focused on the individual change. Um, when we're talking about the change, we're talking about it in context of our application. Um, and so by providing a very focused um, way to, to interact with this, GitHub is actually helping us move, move quickly because we're not distracted by the noise that is kind of the rest of what's happening. Um, another tool that I think most of us are familiar with is Travis CI. Travis is very focused as well. Um, when you submit a pull request to GitHub, Travis picks up on that and it will build it. Um, it's also even, even more focused on the application because it kind of links directly into your GitHub repositories. So the builds that are happening at GitHub or are, are the PRs that are being submitted to GitHub where we're focused on the application are getting picked up in Travis. And so we're, can, you, if, you know, if you look at that, we can see we're starting to create a band of focus. Um, these tools are providing different functionality, but when we look at a PR, we got the context uh, for that PR in, in Travis, so we can follow that line. Um, but one way that you can start thinking about your tooling is how do we provide hooks from other systems to make that, to carry that band of context across. And GitHub is a good example of that as well because they provide um, hooks for Travis to update. So, and it's not just Travis, it's other systems. We can actually start to feed back into GitHub um, some of the information that makes this valuable. Now, how does this relate to moving fast? Um, I'm, I'm sure most of us have been trying to review a PR um, and really relied on this to tell if that PR can be merged. Um, if this type of thing didn't exist, we would actually have to go into Travis. We'd have to find that particular PR. And we'd have to review the logs. But here, we're actually being more efficient because Travis is updating GitHub and telling it, the build's good. You don't need to look at it. Um, so that's just kind of one way th these two tools uh, play into each other. Um, so again, uh, we're here for Spinnaker, so Spinnaker actually changed a lot of the way that I start thinking about my tooling and influenced a lot of this talk. So I want to talk a little bit about how, um, how Spinnaker is helping us focus on the application and focus on our tooling. So first off, we just have, we have an application here. Um, this is, when I talk about a holistic view, you'll hear a lot of us talk about Spinnaker as a single page of glass, and that's exactly what it is. It's got this holistic um, view of the world, what's running in Kubernetes, what's running in Amazon. Um, when we look at it, we look at it in the context of our application, of our service, um, and then we look at what bits of that service are running wherever we need to know. So one of the really great things about Spinnaker is if we have an outage, we have one place to go. 
We only need to go um, to Spinnaker to figure out, okay, what's going on? And this is generally where we start. Um, we saw both of those sides uh, on that one slide where dev uh, operations happen to the middle, uh, ops stuff happens to the right, um, and then we have, we have Spinnaker in the middle. Um, and so this is kind of where we need to start, I think where we need to start picking up some of that context. Um, because we have, we have things like GitHub and we have things like Travis that are on the left where we're already getting that context. Um, but Spinnaker is where we need to start pulling context in from the right. Um, we want to feed as much in on the left and we want to bring stuff on the right. Um, but you know, Spinnaker helps us move fast because we only have to go to one place to figure out what we need. Um, but you know, we're, like I was saying earlier, we're feeding things in on the right. So this is a screenshot of um, a, a build actually being triggered by Jenkins. And what you'll notice is that we can go directly to the build that triggered the deployment. So not only within the context of the code change, within the context of the application can we see what happened, but we're actually starting to get that into our deployment. What happens after something's been built? What happens after a PR gets merged? And so that's what we're showing here. Um, we're saying this build specifically triggered this. We can jump directly into it. So like I was saying earlier, it's not one system that does everything, but if we can if we can plug enough context in from all of these different systems, then we can be efficient when we actually need to go find this information. Uh, we can go directly from Spinnaker, we can go from GitHub. Um, as long as we're you know, creating that band of context across our tools, we can move fast uh, as engineers. Um, what's one way that we can improve on this? Um, this is actually something that I've kind of been, I've, I've thought about a lot in the past. Um, but if we look at how GitHub allows us to uh, bring in this context from other systems, we want to bring in, uh, we want to create that band of context. Um, what if not, instead of having um, our CI systems update GitHub, what if we start having Spinnaker update GitHub? What if we could annotate the artifacts that are being deployed out of GitHub and we start telling uh, GitHub, um, hey, this commit has been deployed to dev, it's been deployed to stage, it's been deployed to prod. And, and what if we could look at a production system and, or we can, we can do maybe like a git bisect, we can track uh, the commit that maybe broke something, and then we can look directly at GitHub for the context that tells us um, uh, what systems, what environments is this actually affecting. Um, so that's, I think that's one way can, we can improve on that. We can start pushing the context all around. It doesn't have to go left to right. It's, it's feeding, everything's feeding into everything. Um, another thing that I think um, can actually start helping us bring this context, I don't have a demo of this, but this annotation driven UI for the Kubernetes uh, v2 provider. What this allows us to do is actually annotate Kubernetes resources and render things in the UI. So we could annotate Kubernetes with a link to our logging platform. And then automatically we have uh, a link directly into that system on the right. We've done, what we've done is we've pulled context from the right, right into the middle, uh, right into Spinnaker, so that we can easily jump to um, the logs, or we may jump into our monitoring service. Um, but the, the value there is that we can do that directly from a single place or uh, a couple places. But we're starting to see how this band of context is, um, is created when we just start plugging information in from these other systems. Um, so when you think about the tooling that you built, that you build, um, what we need, what we, what I really want to kind of get across is how can we pull what? Let take a look at what information you need uh, from all of these external systems, all of the systems that you use every day, and look at how you can actually provide a way to bring that into other platforms. Um, I think there have been a lot of times where I've been sitting in one system and need information from another, but I go spend 30, 40 minutes trying to find it. Um, one of the problems that Spinnaker actually helped me solve was it took me forever to figure out um, what build was actually deployed uh, because I would have to like go into Kubernetes and figure out, okay, you know, Jenkins ran this, um, this apply, but I don't know what image is actually out there. Spinnaker brings that in from the environment and tells me um, what was actually deployed. Um, so really all of that is, you know, to say is that we should just build smarter tools. Um, to move fast, we need tools that, that know more about our environment. They need to know more about 
our processes and our workflows. Um, and so we want to just build really smart tools that allow you to bring that context in uh, to be efficient. Um, so that uh, is kind of wraps up what I had prepared. Um, before I open for questions, I'll just say I work for Armory. We're hiring. Um, we're actually doing some really cool things with Spinnaker. Uh, we're working with a lot of customers to help drive a lot of this, um, this moving quickly. And we see a lot of people who want this. They want the tools that that create that band of context. Mm -hmm.